el representante del gobierno de Líbano, Rafael de Prado, from uh, Spain's International Cooperation Agency. Welcome to you all. Welcome to Casa Arabe. Today, uh, we are holding the second of the two roundtable sessions that Casa Arabe is hosting about the regional dimension of the Syrian refugee crisis. The purpose uh, of this event uh, is to analyze and to highlight the impact uh, that the refugee crisis is having on the region. It's, of course, a crisis that uh, stems from the Syrian conflict. Uh, we want to also deal with the problems of dealing uh, with uh, the population effect, uh, how to give them the humanitarian they need, and also look at the social and economic impact uh, on neighboring countries, um, especially Turkey, to Lebanon, and Jordan. On the 3rd of November, we held the first of the two panel sessions and we analyzed the refugee crisis from a regional perspective. But what we did then was deal with the social and economic impact and the humanitarian relief facet of the question. So today, what we want to do is analyze the way in which the neighboring countries are dealing with the situation and the measures that they're taking to find a solution to the situation. Since the outset of the conflict, uh, that was for over the last four years, the neighboring countries have um, received more than 4 million refugees. Uh, just imagine the problems uh, that figure entails with regard to the assistance uh, and uh, the way the whole issue is managed. The capacity of these countries to absorb those refugees uh, really is uh, being overwhelmed. And that means that this problem, the crisis itself, uh, is uh, now spilling over to Europe and crossing European borders to analyze then the response uh, to this problem. problem. We have with us here Omar Onohon, who is the Turkish ambassador here in Spain, uh, Hala Helu, who is the, an advisor in, to the Minister of Social Affairs in the Lebanon on humanitarian issues and international relations, and Rafael de Prado, who is the, the head, the alternate head of uh, the humanitarian relief uh, office here in the agency here. You've seen that uh, no representative of the Jordanian the Iranian government uh, was on the original program, they said, that you've been sent. That was because the person who was going to join is directly traveling from Amman, unfortunately, had to cancel his trip at the last moment. But very fortunately, the Jordanian embassy has uh, made a huge effort to send us a representative. We now have Najev Farad with us, uh, who is the counselor from the embassy, and he'll pop us today to analyze the response from Jordan to this problem. Casa Arabe will continue to do further work on this issue because the expectation is that this crisis will not wane, of course. In fact, we're expecting things to get worse because um, of uh, the exacerbation of uh, violence in Syria and because winter is approaching on the 11th of December, we will be scheduling a feature film, uh, a mid-length feature film that will be put on here. It's been produced in Spain. In fact, there'll be a, a, a double program there. We'll be uh, seeing El Royo de Escondite, which is a game of hide and seek uh, by David Munoz and District Zero by Pablo Iraburo. Pablo Tosco and Jorge Fernandez Mayrell. Before we get started with our roundtable session today, we're going to show you an extract from Honey Story. Now, that's a documentary produced and directed by Zahara Makawi. It's actually a co production between um, UNHCR and Channel 4, the British Channel, and it's been subtitled by the UNHCR in Spanish, uh, so it can be shown here in Casa Arabe. You'll be able to see just two episodes uh, of the full story, but you can, of course, uh, no, three, I'll be told, three episodes, three and a half episodes we'll be watching here this afternoon out of the five, but you can uh, follow the link onto the, web, onto the website and see the full story. So this is a story of a Syrian family living in a refugee camp in the Lebanon, 
And what we'll be seeing in the story, in the film, will be the day-to-day -day life of this family in that refugee camp. But the, the son, one of the sons uh, and the family uh, has a knife problem, a knife condition. He can only see as far as the length of his arm. And, and he, so he's turned to a camera to help him. He takes snapshots of uh, the way he's living in the camp in Lebanon. The eye condition that he has uh, helps him in the end to get the chance uh, to travel with his family to uh, Canada as refugees. And in fact, the family itself are saved from uh, their, their situation in the camp because of this uh, eye condition that one of the children has the son. I, uh, I don't want to uh, jump the gun here with the story. Uh, and. I would like to later on ask people to join me up here, but first of all, we'll see the film. Bueno, después de esta After that uh, magnificent introduction to the event, we can hear from our speakers this evening who will enlighten us even more about this whole issue. And I, I do know that this is, uh, of course, a, a very current issue right now, and people are very interested in it. Let me give the floor, first of all, to the representative from the government of Lebanon, hello, hello, who will be talking to us about the Lebanon. We did get a, a little insight in, into what's happening there in uh, this short documentary. She'll be telling us about the position of the Lebanese authorities uh, and how the authorities in Lebanon are dealing with the civil refugees. Thank you. you. You have the floor. Good evening. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you, Casa Arabi, for giving us this chance of coming here and uh, giving you an idea of what is actually happening um, in Lebanon and in the other uh, neighboring host countries. Um, I think the video was uh, very expressive. On It gives you one idea of what it is to be a refugee in a country like Lebanon. Um, what I'm going to tell you about this video is that um, it represents the better side of the refugees living in the country. Um, from what I saw in the pictures, these are people living in some good conditions. They actually have a kitchen. They actually have food around the table. They have a TV. They have cell phones. Today, thank you. Um, today, Lebanon is a country that is 10,452 square kilometers. It's a very small country. We have 4 million Lebanese. We have about 350,000 Palestinians who have been living in this country for 60 or 70 years. We have some other 150,000 other nationalities. Sorry some other nationalities. And today, we are hosting 1.5 million Syrians. We're not talking about 1.5 million refugees. We are talking about 1.5 million Syrian citizens living with us, sharing our land, sharing our services, uh, living side by side with every Lebanese citizen. So it's a country that has 4 million Lebanese and has 2 million non-Lebanese living in it. Uh, Lebanon has reached a point where we had a sudden increase of 30% to our population in just three years. This is a number that no other country in the world has experienced so far. With this, you have heard from um, Hani and his family that it's too crowded in Lebanon, and it's a country that doesn't fit for everybody anymore. And it is true. A country as small as Lebanon uh, hosting six million people living together does not fit for anybody anymore. Um, we have had an open door policy since day one. On May 14th, 2011, we received our first true influx of Syrian refugees to the northern area of Lebanon, just the place where Hani and his family are, are residing. All of these had been families and friends of the Lebanese population. There are a lot of relations between the Lebanese and the Syrians, and these people constitute same families divided by a border. 
So from then on, we reached in four years, 1.5 million Syrians. Now, when we say that um, today we have four million Syrian refugees around the world, we're only talking about Syrian refugees registered with UNHCR. And this is not the accurate number. The accurate number is each of us, from as representatives of the countries, we know how many Syrians we have in our own countries. I think today Turkey has the largest number, uh, followed by Lebanon, followed by Jordan. Lebanon has 1.078 million refugees registered, but we do have 1.5 million Syrians. If we want to consider what has been done and what will be done with these Syrian refugees, we look at many situations like Hani and his family. We look at people who have come in to a country thinking that they're coming in for a month or two and then kind of having to go back. Um, all of a sudden discovering that they have to stay here for one year, then two years, then four years. And today it's a protracted situation where nobody knows how many years they will be staying. Lebanon is a country that has no camps. So the settlement that we have seen in the video is just a random settlement, as Hani's mother has said. People just come in and they find a place to sit and they just set up a tent and sit there. Um, in, with the difference with uh, Turkey and Jordan, who have official camps, Lebanon has absolutely no official camps. Today we have about 18.5% of the registered population with UNHCR living in these kinds of settlements. These are settlements that have very low living standards, uh, absolutely no attention to sanitary conditions, living in very rough conditions. The main reason for that is that other places in Lebanon do not fit anymore. We're a country that has no more places to host Syrian refugees. It's a very small country with no places. Another reason is that people have been hosting, the Lebanese host community has been hosting the Syrians for the past four years in their homes, sharing their water, sharing their food, sharing their electricity, sharing all kinds of resources. Today, 68% of the Lebanese host community, which is the poorest Lebanese, are hosting 86% of the Syrians. So 86% of the Syrian population is being hosted by the poorest, poorest Lebanese. Having all of these vulnerable communities living together means that vulnerability increases for everybody. So Lebanese are getting poorer, Syrians are getting poorer. Le uh, Syrians are not able anymore to pay the rents Lebanese are not able to pay for both communities. So the numbers of Syrians who are going to these conditions, like this camp, is increasing. Today it's 18.4% of the population who is registered. Tomorrow or next year it could go, it could go up to 25%. Lebanon gets support. but. It's the United Nations that gets the support to support the refugees. We saw that uh, the World Food Program provides food vouchers for the Syrians. Back in 2014, they used to get $27 per person for five individuals per family. In the beginning of 2015, that amount went down to $19 per person for five individuals per family. In August 2015, that number went down to $13.5 per person for, for five persons per family. We're talking about a population that has to live off of $65 a month of food assistance. Um, fortunately enough, uh, about a month and a half ago, more uh, assistance has come in to WFP and that amount has increased to $21.5. But still, $21.5 is a very small number for those families. Now, if we talk about some of the repercussions, and that goes straight to what the policies are today, because every country of us has had to take certain policies to deal with the situation. 
when we're talking about six million people living in the same uh, place, we don't talk anymore about pure refugee and humanitarian situation. We have been dealing with an emergency situation and a humanitarian situation for the past four years. But today it has become a national crisis. It has come, become a true crisis for each and every one of these host countries. Today, Lebanon has had an infrastructure that was supposed to last it for about 15 to 20 years. In the first two years of the crisis, our infrastructure was completely depleted. We have had services that were very poor to start with because Lebanon is a country that recently came out of a national of a civil war and who has been going through a lot of political and security crises for the past 20 years. So all our services have already been very weak. With an additional 1.5 million people making use of these services, these services have deteriorated largely. In addition, we've had a constant economic growth in the past maybe 15 years that used to reach 10%. Last year, it went down to 1.5%. This year, it was announced three weeks ago that we have reached 0% economic growth. This is in addition to having 1.5 million people. At least out of these 1.5 million people, we have, let's say, 700,000 who need to work. Lebanon for the past 30 years has been uh, relying greatly on Syrian laborers for our agricultural sector and our construction sector. However, with this large increase in numbers, there is a huge competition among the Syrians themselves to work in these two sectors. And with the current situation, we don't have sectors anymore. Uh, we rely greatly on Syria in order to, Syrian land, to export our uh, agricultural pro products to the Gulf countries, to the rest of the world. So that border for us has been closed. Our other border, of course, with Palestine is also closed. And the third border is the sea, which is very expensive. So we have lost our land borders. We have lost our export and import. We have lost our agricultural business. Um, th therefore, Syrians who used to work in these sectors are today losing those jobs. And there's increased competition with the, with the other Syrians on these jobs. What is more <laughs> critical for us is that the increase in the number of Syrians in Lebanon means that we have people who need work in other professions. And this has increased the competition with the Lebanese in Lebanon in some low-skill jobs. This is creating additional problems for the country. Today, there is an increased unemployment among the Lebanese. There is a very high rate of emigration for Lebanese youth. Um, there are Syrians living without work. There are Lebanese living without work. The situation in our country is getting more and more dramatic by the day. Now, one of the main things that we did as a country in to, back in 2014 was to decide that 1.5 million is a very large number. And in order for us to be able to take care of this 1.5 million and the half a million of other nationalities and the 4 million Lebanese, we need to stop displacement into Lebanon. What we have done is we have kept our borders open to Syrians. We have very special relations with Syria. We have uh, bilateral relations, so our borders are always open to any Syrian citizens who, a citizen who wishes to come to Lebanon, as long as it is not coming to stay for a longer time. If we have additional people coming in to stay for a longer time, we're always at risk of not being able to provide them with what is needed. As I said before, assistance is coming in, but it comes in for the United Nations, it comes in for the NGOs, it doesn't come in for Lebanon as a country. So we had new procedures that started in 2015 that limit the access of those seeking a protracted stay in the country, but welcomes everybody else who wishes to stay in the country. Of course, these procedures uh, received a lot of uh, criticism from the whole world, received a lot of criticism from Europe in particular, 
from our European friends and colleagues, from the US, from Canada, from everybody else. We were at some points accused of violating human rights. We were accused of closing our borders in the faces of those who need to, uh, to seek asylum in our country. Uh, we were accused of mistreating Syrians because we announced that we will not be receiving refugees anymore, even though we are receiving Syrian citizens. Um, and it's as a host country, and I believe that it's the same with Jordan and Turkey and uh, Egypt and Iraq, uh, we had to deal with our own problems internally before we were able to deal with all of the criticism that we were uh, reaching, that was reaching us. And all of a sudden, uh, a couple of months ago, and even though we've been warning Europe and the rest of the world by saying two things, we've always said the only solution for all of this is a political solution in Syria and that the whole world really needs to put a great effort to end this crisis in Syria. And it's not up to the neighboring host countries who are already suffering to put that end to the crisis. We've said that this vulnerability in Syria and this vulnerability that is being created in the neighboring countries, this poverty, creates more extremism. And extremism and terrorism know no borders these borders will be stepped over and this crisis could reach Europe and the rest of the world very soon. Refugees will not have a place in our countries anymore. They will feel that they are suffocating and they will go to Europe first. There's only a sea separating us and that's the easiest place for them to go. Unfortunately, we've been saying this for the past two and a half or three years and nobody listened. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of uh, dissent, and it wasn't until a month and a half ago, or two months ago, that Europe started witnessing what we have been witnessing. But Europe has been witnessing an influx of 100,000 and 120,000 people. Uh, they've been having parliamentary sessions, they've been having all kinds of meetings just to be able to deal with 100,000 refugees and 120,000 refugees. I was today giving an example to His Excellency about one small village in Lebanon, which has 35,000 Lebanese living in it. And a year ago, it was hosting 120,000 Syrians. Now it's hosting 85,000 Syrians. So that's just one village in Lebanon. And Europe is um, turning around itself to try and figure out how to fit 120,000 Syrians. Um, we know that we're the closest countries. We are, uh, we should take care of our neighbors and we are taking care of our neighbors. But for us, we see some double, some double standards in what is happening. We see that we've been accused of human rights, not only us, Turkey has been accused of human rights violations, Jordan has been accused of human rights violations, and we just look at some of the videos that show how Europe actually dealt with the people who have come to its borders. And this is unfortunate for us. We saw that one picture of one small child called Ailan how it shook the world. And we know that about 300,000 other children have been treated the same way and nobody looked at them. Um, no matter how unfortunate the event was, at least it was an eye opener, opener for the world. But we do know that there are many islands all around Syria. There are many islands who tried to go through Lebanon, through Turkey to get to a place where there is safety, and unfortunately they have not found any safety there. So, in a nutshell, our countries have been suffering. Um, we had to take certain rules, certain procedures, uh, but the only way for us to help Syrians is to support the host countries, to start 
putting money into the host countries, <coughs> investing in the host countries, moving from a humanitarian approach, going into more stabilization and development approach, because money will end sometime. And these countries will be left to deal with the Syrians themselves. And if we don't get necessary support, then we will not be able to deal neither with our people nor with the Syrians. And one last thing, and I wanted to really stress on that, and that's looking into hosting Syrians all around the world is something that is very important. Looking into resettlement conditions for Syrians is also important. But our fear is that through uh, extensive resettlement uh, procedures, we will be emptying Syria of its people. We will be emptying Syria of its most important resources. What is needed at this point is for people to start considering how to invest inside Syria, because there are a lot of chances to invest inside Syria. It's not true that Syria is all um, a war zone where people cannot invest. We live there, we know everybody today inside Syria is saying, come and invest. Stop uprooting people from their land, help them stay in their land, provide them with jobs inside, provide them with work opportunities inside, and this is how you truly preserve this region, preserve its people. Thank you. Um. <clears throat> That, that, that is so interesting, you know, the, the, the facts and figures you've just given us, the, the, the fact that you've talked about investing in Syria and, and doing that could really alleviate to some extent uh, the, the crisis, the situation, not just in the Lebanon but in the neighboring countries too. Let me give the floor straight away to uh, the, the councillor for uh, the Jordanian embassy here in uh, Madrid. And I, Najeb Barad, thank you so much once again for being uh, so willing uh, to come along today and represent uh, the government of Jordan. Thank you. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <coughs> thank you for inviting us and for organizing this very important uh, session about the Syrian refugees. Uh, the Syrian crisis is really a really serious problem. Uh, and uh, the current development shows us that, that it's not an issue or uh, the implications of the Syrian conflict is not only affecting the neighboring country, it's spilling over to Europe and to other countries. It's a serious universal problem. Uh, the current uh, terrorist attack that took place in Paris, the influx of the Syrian refugees coming to Europe shows the whole world that the Syrian issue is a serious one and we should find a solution as soon as possible. Jordan believed from the first day that the only solution is in Syria should be a comprehensive political solution that meets the aspiration of the Syrian people. And uh, these uh, talks or uh, uh, solutions should also compromise or uh, have all the component of the Sur uh, Syrian uh, society. Regarding the Syrian refugees and Jordan, from the first uh, day we adopted an open policy door with the Syrian refugees and we uh, thought that the best way to deal with the Syrian refugees is th through three level approach. The first one is to stabilize and help the Syrians inside Syria. The second one is to support the Syrian refugees in hosting countries, and the third approach is through supporting the host communities in neighboring countries. And we thought that this is the best way to deal with the Syrian uh, refugee issue because we thought from the beginning we knew that it will be a protracted uh, problem, not a, a weeks or uh, even years uh, issue. Now let me give you some figures about the uh, Syrian refugees in Jordan in order to better understand what kind of problem we are facing in Jordan. The population of Jordan is 7 million uh, people. We have 1.5 million Syrians living in Jordan. Around 650 of them is registered with UNHCR. As my colleague uh, Hala said, but at the end of the day we are having 1.5 million Syrians in Jordan. 
which is around 20% of the population of Jordan. And uh, maybe many photos, and even the brochure for this lecture shows the, one of the biggest uh, uh, refugee camps in Jordan. But actually, only 10% of Syrians lives in refugee camps in Jordan. 90% of the Syrians live outside in the, the camps. They live in host communities and in big cities and in small villages. They live everywhere in Jordan. So it's, uh, it's not uh, only a problem in uh, certain areas. It's, it's all, over the uh, all over Jordan, especially in the northern part of Jordan. Uh, also, I'll give you another figures about the component of the Syrian refugees that we are having in Jordan. Uh, now, uh, Jordan allowed the Syrian students to uh, get enrolled in schools. So now we are having 140,000 Syrians in schools, in public schools or schools inside the camps. Uh, now, around 100 public schools in Jordan is working two shifts. We are having a morning shift and an evening shift. Also, we're having uh, around 18% uh, of the Syrian refugees are under five years old. And 53% are children. 23% are women. So you can understand what kind of care and health care and education and everything that the government needs to provide. Also, I would like to you know, touch upon our economy. After the Syrian conflict, the economy of Jordan is suffering due to many uh, implications uh, that took place after the Syrian uh, conflict. For example, 40% of our trade with Europe used to go through Syria. Now there's alternative and more expensive way. So it will, uh, the, the, uh, the export to Europe went down a lot in Jordan. Also, the tourism sector, the tourism sector used to represent 14% of the GDP of Jordan. Now it's going down as well because of the uh, whole situation in the Middle East. One very important issue in Jordan is the security issue. The security issue because Jordan, first of all, we have like 650 kilometers 350 kilometers with Syria and 300 kilometers with Iraq. And we are uh, surrounded by the so-called uh, ISIS, and uh, for us it's a terrorist organization, and uh, they are threatening Jordan publicly. So this is a huge burden on a country like Jordan to protect 700 kilometers, 650 kilometers of uh, borders. Second thing is to, uh, monitor 1.5 million Syrian refugees in Jordan. Whereas we are, we are a very small country and we have very limited resources. We don't have natural resources like uh, other uh, neighboring countries. I don't mean Lebanon or Turkey, <laughs> the same shoe. Uh, for example, I'll give you also an, the, the, the cost of hosting, the direct and indirect cost of hosting Syrians in Jordan in 2015 was estimated to reach $2 billion, okay? <clears throat> but you have to know that the budget of Jordan is $10 billion. So it's like 20% of our budget, which already has 10% of deficit. So this is, it's like, you know, it's like taking the population of uh, uh, Belgium and take them uh, during two or three years to the United Kingdom. It's the same case in Jordan with their issues, with their needs, with their... So it's a serious problem. Uh, actually, I would like to touch on the, uh, the 
uh, Jordan Response Plan. Jordan now is, uh, has launched a Jordan Response Plan for 2016, 17, and 18 in cooperation with all the NGOs, the United Nations agencies to handle the Syrian refugees issues. And uh, this uh, plan covers a program of targeted uh, interventions to assist both refugees and the host communities in Jordan uh, across 11 sectors. And uh, I don't want to go into numbers, but I don't think it's a huge number to, the, the, the donors can take uh, care of it. I think it's like two billion, uh, two to three billion dollars uh, per year. And also Jordan agreed with the uh, NGOs and the United Nations also to look for non-traditional donors, maybe private companies or something, because we, we should find uh, some kind of funding for this uh, issue. Uh, for example, the UN programs and the agencies, including UNRWA, UNHCR, World Food Program, uh, they are having serious uh, shortfalls in uh, financial uh, resources. Uh, we presented this uh, Jordan response plan, uh, I think, three weeks ago. Until now, unfortunately, we, we think that we are, we are able to find 6% funding for this uh, uh, program, which will be conducted over the next three years. Uh, I will... I will leave some time for Q&A, maybe I can answer some questions. But I would like to uh, quote uh, our uh, His Majesty the King, uh, because he stated, uh, when he stated a speech in the General Assembly, United Nations General Assembly, last September, and I'm quoting him here, we have, take, we have been taking on a significant part of the burden of this humanitarian disaster of the international community's shoulders since the beginning. However, support to our country has been a small fraction of the cost we have endured. So this, this is a summary of the situation in Jordan, uh, the burdens that Jordan is handling. Of course, I don't want to repeat what uh, Hala said because it's the same. The uh, water resources, knowing that Jordan is the second poorest country in the world in water resources. We are now considered to be the second largest host per capita for uh, refugees. So uh, also, the, again, the education and uh, medical and infrastructure and jobs also, because uh, there is a competition between the host communities, uh, communities and the well-trained uh, Syrian uh, refugees. So again, I will leave it for a question if someone has any question or something. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Tiene la palabra Homero Non, que es el embajador de Turquía en España. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank to uh, Casa Arabe for uh, organizing this meeting and uh, inviting us here. Uh, well, like my uh, friends to my right, uh, the country that I represent is also uh, under a very, uh, very enormous uh, pressure uh, because of the uh, crisis that we are facing uh, for the last four or five years. But. Uh, the issue of refugees is nothing uh, new for Turkey. Uh, I mean, Turkey has been a refugee-taking country for uh, not years, but uh, decades, uh, starting from uh, past centuries. I mean, uh, we are 78 million people, and about 40% or 45% of the total population of Turkey are refugees, actually. Uh, all came from Caucasus, from Balkans, here and there. Uh, and uh, most recently, before the Syrian crisis, uh, we had the refugees from uh, Bosnia, we had the refugees from uh, Bulgaria at the time of Zhivkov, we had refugees from uh, Iraq uh, on several occasions uh, during the time of Saddam, and now we are facing uh, a very important, a very serious challenge uh, emanating 
from Syria and also Iraq, actually. In Turkey uh, today, uh, according to the uh, official UNHCR figures, we have 2.2 uh, Syrian refugees registered. On top of that, we have Iraqis, uh, Kurds, Yezidis, uh, and others, and also uh, refugees from other countries. So in total, I would say uh, it's well beyond uh, 2.5 million people uh, in Turkey, close to 3 million. But 2.2 million of them are uh, refugees. Now, uh, the Syrian crisis started in uh, March 2011. Uh, and the first refugees started, or not refugees, but uh, Syrians, let's say, uh, they started to come uh, into Turkey in May. Uh, at first, there were uh, maybe some hundreds of them, uh, and then uh, this became thousands, and then tens of thousands, and then hundreds of thousands. Uh, at the time, we uh, noticed that uh, this problem in Syria was not going to finish soon, and we would have many, many more uh, people coming into Turkey and other countries, but uh, into Turkey. So we started to uh, set up camps. Uh, we call these camps uh, temporary protection centers. And we have 25 of them uh, in uh, 10 different places, uh, and uh, they are camps of very, very high standards. I mean, uh, this is not me saying this as a Turkish official, uh, but this is uh, what uh, international organizations like the UNHCR and other organizations dealing with the refugees is saying very clearly. In these camps, uh, we accommodate about 260,000 uh, people, uh, Syrians, 262,000 Syrians are accommodated uh, in these camps. The others, uh, the 2.2 uh, and more million, uh, they live uh, all over Turkey in uh, different cities, uh, in different places. Now, uh, in the camps, of course, we provide uh, our guests, as we call them. Uh, we provide them food. We provide them uh, health services. We provide... Uh, social services, psychological support, which is very important, uh, medical care, and so on. Uh, and it's not uh, easy, really. I mean, uh, imagine these people have uh, come to Turkey uh, starting from four, four and a half years ago, and they have been remaining in, in these camps for uh, throughout this period. It's not uh, easy. Uh, in the camps, we have about uh, 78,000 children, school-age children. Uh, we provide them with education uh, in the camps. And then we have about uh, 135,000 children uh, who are the children of the families living outside the camps, and they go to schools uh, to all over uh, in Turkey. Uh, we also provide... Uh, free medical care for every Syrian. Uh, we provide them with, uh, well, we give them an identity card, a temporary identity card, and those people who can uh, show their identity cards can get free treatment, they can get uh, food uh, and all uh, other services. Now, uh, I very much sympathize with my friends here. Yes, uh, when you compare Turkey with Jordan and uh, Lebanon, of course, population-wise, uh, it's not comparable. Uh, also, economically, it's not comparable. Uh, I mean, we are talking here, uh, Turkey is uh, the 16th or 17th largest economy in the world. But still, uh, that does not mean uh, that uh, we don't uh, face any problems. We are facing very, very serious uh, problems. Uh, maybe less so in terms of numbers, I mean, when compared to the population, but it's a big burden uh, to be assumed by, uh, by only uh, one country. Now, uh, I, have, uh, I want to share with you my uh, thoughts on uh, a few aspects. First of all, uh, we are very unlucky uh, that we are 
uh, neighboring uh, Syria. Uh, and so is Jordan, so is uh, Lebanon. Uh, but our uh, geographic location, uh, of course, uh, gives us uh, certain responsibilities. I mean, first of all, as we say, in that part of the world, uh, you have to have, uh, you have to uh, look after your neighbor. Yes, definitely, in time of need, especially. But being a neighbor uh, should not be understood as if it is our uh, problem only, because it's not. Uh, I mean, Syria could have been next to Spain, for example, or next to some other country. And don't forget, in the past, Europe lived through very serious uh, refugee crisis. Uh, go back to World War II. I mean, there was an enormous uh, refugee crisis in many places. Uh, go back to uh, the times that we don't want to remember in Spain. There were refugee crises. I mean, people opened their doors other countries to those who were in need. Go to Bosnia during the war, we had refugee crisis. I mean, what I'm trying to say is uh, it can happen to anybody uh, in this world. So we have to think uh, as a human being. I mean, what human beings do to each other in uh, times of need. So we cannot uh, say well, Syria or Iraq is very far away from us. We have 10,000 kilometers between us, uh, so let them deal with it. No, like terrorism, uh, we see that crises are never too far away from any country. Uh, suddenly, uh, you can find all these crises at your uh, doorstep. Now, uh, we have been following uh, the developments in Europe uh, with the inflow of refugees in, uh, to this uh, continent. Uh, and there is a big shock, and maybe rightly so, but I have to say uh, this concept of uh, mass immigration, irregular uh, flow of people in big numbers uh, is not a big surprise. Uh, because after the Cold War uh, in after 1990, after the Cold War ended, uh, <clears throat> many uh, countries and international organizations uh, started to think about uh, the new challenges uh, ahead of us. And among these challenges uh, in NATO, I know firsthand, in the EU, uh, in uh, the United Nations, and in other international organizations, uh, people started to think about new challenges, and among the new challenges were international terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, and mass immigration. So we cannot say that we were caught by surprise, because everybody knew that in the new world, things like that could happen. So uh, we should have been uh, prepared. Secondly, uh, Turkey, uh, as uh, my friends here uh, stated for their own countries, Turkey also applied an open door policy. We could not close our doors to the Syrians. Uh, first of all, as I said, uh, they are in time of need. Uh, they are fleeing for their lives. I mean, children, old people, young people, women, men, everybody. Uh, you simply cannot uh, close your borders to them, especially uh, when these people in question uh, have lived with us for centuries and we have very strong relations with them. I mean, uh, we are not Arab, Arabic speaking, we are not Arabs, but still we lived together for centuries and we had uh, very special relations, so you cannot uh, really close your uh, doors to people uh, in need. So we applied an open door policy. Was that easy? No, it's not. There are always problems, but then uh, you have to take the risk. I mean, if you are doing something on a humanitarian uh, basis, if you are doing something for humanitarian reasons, then you have to take uh, the risk. The people that we took in, we did not ask uh, what your religion is, 
or what your ethnic background is or what uh, your sectarian background is, regardless of their background, we accepted them. We took them uh, into our country. Uh, now you can draw a comparison uh, with some of the statements today uh, from well, various uh, places saying that, yes, I can take in uh, refugees, but no more than uh, 500, and they should be uh, from that particular religion uh, or from that particular ethnicity. I mean, uh, really, I don't want to comment on that because I think this is very uh, out of place uh, approach. Uh, I said, uh, I will repeat, even if you are the strongest economy in the world, uh, it's impossible uh, to deal uh, with such crisis uh, by yourself. I mean, the extent, the scope of the crisis have gone beyond, much beyond, the point where one or two or three countries can deal with. No, uh, it's a collective uh, responsibility, really. Uh, definitely, uh, these people, I very much agree, uh, Syria, uh, I lived in Syria for uh, six years. Uh, Syria is a great country, and the Syrian people are uh, great people, uh, very well uh, educated, very smart, and uh, I'm sure uh, they will pick up again, but they will need all uh, the brains and all the workforce that uh, is available to them, and they, have, they had plenty of them. Uh, I hope that uh, there will not be a brain drain uh, from Syria because Syria will very much uh, need these people to rebuild uh, the country. Uh, so in Turkey, we look at the issue in terms of, uh, I mean, temporary is the word. We are giving temporary protection to these people. Uh, they are not in Turkey to stay. But what is temporary? I mean, if you look at the dictionary, temporary is something very short. Uh, in this case, it has been five years. It can be maybe 10 years. It, it doesn't matter. I mean, we will uh, continue uh, to take care of them as much as we can, as long as it takes. But in the end, it is temporary. But then again, uh, I don't have the figures with me now, uh, but Imagine children who fled Syria uh, four years ago, who were, let's say, five years old, are nine years old today. Uh, or uh, we have tens of thousands of Syrian children who are born in Turkey, uh, and the only place that they know uh, is Turkey. I mean, they don't know anything about Syria apart from what they uh, hear from their parents. So it's very important uh, to make sure that these uh, children know who they are. Uh, do not forget their identity. Uh, as uh, my Jordanian uh, friend here said, uh, of course, whatever measures that we take will be temporary relief. We have to look for a lasting solution. And the lasting solution is a political solution in Syria, which would bring the conflict to an end and which would <clears throat> allow people to go uh, to safety back in their country. So a political solution, a political process, the success of it is very important. Another uh, proposal that uh, Turkey uh, brought up, and we still continue to believe that it's a good idea, is uh, to establish kind of uh, safe zones in Syria so that people will not uh, flee their countries, but will remain within their territories, again, in camps uh, established with the assistance of the international community, and in a way protected by the international community. But again, this is a temporary solution, so we have to look for a lasting solution. And last but not least, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is not a, a problem, I mean, this is a terrible human tragedy, really. I mean, watching this film, even, uh, I mean, it gives you an idea of what uh, difficulties people are uh, facing with. Uh, 
but it is not the responsibility of only one country. Today, up today, Turkey spent eight point, more than 8.5 billion dollars and only 416 million dollars of that came in as an assistance. And uh, I mean, where was the international community? Uh, you know, we heard a lot of speeches about the humanitarian tragedy. We heard a lot of uh, statements about humanitarian tragedy. But statements are good. I mean, they create awareness. But statements are not enough by themselves. I mean, they have to be supported by concrete action. And this action started to come when Island Kurdi, uh, the baby's body, uh, was on the shores uh, of Turkey. But do you know how many children of the same age have been killed since Island Kurdi? I mean, yesterday I read somewhere that 111 children, more or less, his age are killed since that date. So what changed? Uh, burden sharing and responsibility sharing is a must. Unless uh, the international community really assumes responsibility, but not for papers, not for newspapers or uh, PR activity, but in real terms, unless the international community uh, assumes its responsibility and uh, faces this challenge together, uh, I'm afraid we are going to uh, face uh, a lot more years uh, with this kind of crisis and its uh, implications all around us. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, embajador. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Well, now that we've heard such interesting uh, statements and the comments from the neighboring countries, these three countries that have been uh, so much affected by the crisis, we thought it would be a good idea to follow on, to hear from Spain, to hear what Spain is doing to help with this crisis management, Rafael de Prado is with us here. He is the representative for Spain's uh, International Development Corporation Agency. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Casa Arabe, too, for hosting this event, uh, for dealing with such priority issues that we feel are priority issues. Uh, first of all, uh, Spain, I think, uh, has to, of course, uh, acknowledge uh, the hosting uh, of uh, refugees uh, that has gone on. We understand the scale and the scope uh, uh, of the countries like uh, Jordan, the Lebanon and Turkey and, and the, their generosity. I think that's the very first thing we need to underline. Uh, we're very much in acknowledgement of what you've done. It's also very hard to find words or arguments. And after that very uh, moving documentary that we've uh, seen, we've seen Hani's story and what's happened to the Lebanon. We ourselves have been there on the ground, uh, we've been out there, and we know exactly uh, and what a dramatic situation uh, this uh, is. What I want to do then is just to give you a few pointers to Spain's response. Uh, and it's now quarter past eight, uh, and I'm the last panel speaker, so I don't want to bore anybody at this point. And I'd also like to make a few comments uh, on the international response uh, to the Syrian crisis. First of all, the Spanish response. Spain's response has really uh, mean, meant a tremendous effort over the last three years. We're talking about 10 million uh, euros uh, over the last uh, uh, three years. Uh, and this year, I believe it will be 13 or 14 million uh, in the latest request uh, for projects from NGOs. Uh, this goes through the international uh, development uh, cooperation agency, that's what I'm talking about, the, the public um, overseas aid. We've also offered uh, specific uh, credits, uh, lending uh, these specific loans that have been granted. Uh, there was one that was um, announced just recently by Prime Minister Rajoy, th 3 million euros more to deal with the crisis. And then through agencies and organizations, uh, 
I have to say, actually, that the humanitarian response has been absolutely rigorous. It's always been based on needs and capabilities and humanitarian response. Spain it has not actually been um, delivering the aid. We've worked with our partners, uh, such as UNHCR, UNICEF, uh, the World Food Programme. Uh, we have we've been working with uh, the funding mechanisms that exist in Europe, the, uh, the emergency mechanism, and also with the International um, Red Cross and Red Crescent um, Committee. And Spain has particularly been in the Beca Value in Lebanon, but it's also we've been present in Jordan and, and other areas trying to help the refugees. I don't think there has been enough done uh, as far as resources. We have to acknowledge that. It's not just me saying that, uh, but uh, we've had a peer review uh, carried out uh, already, and it's not enough what we're doing. The good news, though, is that Spain's position has been extremely neutral uh, based uh, on um, the, the the right principles that we've seen in the uh, in the last DAC re report uh, there's also a role uh, inside Syria and with Jordan uh, and with New Zealand. Uh, we're also the co-reporters, uh, rapporteurs there. With re we're working with the UN Security Council. The the uh, the latest uh, resolutions, uh, 2191, I think, uh, we've been working to ensure that there is protection for civilians um, with regard to indiscriminate attacks on the civil po civilian populations, infrastructures, and humanitarian personnel. You know that there have been uh, attacks against uh, health uh, personnel and health centers, the question of uh, uh, access to difficult uh, um, besieged areas. All of these uh, issues have been discussed uh, by Spain with different agents uh, as the fact that I said we are co-rapporteurs there with the UNO and Sukhachewin Council. We've been working together with our humanitarian aid office here in the International Cooperation Agency. We have to at least make sure that we minimize the damage on the civilian population because there's people that are so resilient that there was a meeting there at the Dead Sea about this in Jordan on the resilience plan for Syria. All of these practices that have run completely counter to humanitarian law cause people to be displaced. We have all these internal displaced persons and end up with refugees. And this is something Spain has brought up in the UN. There will be a conference coming up, a Red Cross conference in Geneva, about seeing how we can actually make sure that there is full application of international humanitarian law. And Spain is certainly very much committed to IHL being uh, pivotal to the response uh, of countries. That is uh, at least one positive facet that we're working on. Some food for thought for you. I think we have to think about the international context. And it's true to say that the regional response to the Syrian crisis, uh, that's about 35 to 40 percent, I think, of, of the humanitarian aid is being financed there. And so the 60 or 65 percent of the funding uh, that uh, has to come from the international community. There's the burden sharing that uh, is uh, UNHCR's uh, terminology is not right. Uh, it's, it's, it's not the right balance. We have to also understand uh, the areas that we're working on, first of all, the backdrop, the general situation, we can't forget that uh, it was March 2011 when the crisis kicked off, and then we've had uh, Yemen, uh, South Sudan, e Ebola, e we've had uh, the Democratic um, Republic of Congo. There's been pressure on the donor countries, uh, as well as the call for the uh, UN for more than $20 billion um, from the international community. And this has been growing expen exponentially in the last three, four or five years. Uh, the figure for humanitarian relief that is required is just soaring. So that's the first uh, idea for you, food for thought. Uh, so the global panorama, you're talking about worldwide needs there, not just in Syria and other countries. It, this, it's massive. Uh, natural disasters, uh, typhoons. Uh, epidemics uh, such as Ebola, all of that drains the resources uh, from the international community away from uh, countries in conflict like Syria, and uh, that has had a, a direct impact on, on UN funding. Uh, a second point that I think we should highlight is uh, the the mid-income country, Spain, I think for the last eight or ten years, uh, and I'm going back to, to the DAC uh, peer review 
about this is under the OECD has come up with recommendations for Spain to come out of the mid-income uh, countries uh, and that uh, has been a problem because the the Oman office has been closed down we had uh, we had a coast cordon actually that actually packed up the suitcases and was ready to go home we managed to keep it open because uh, of the Syrian crisis and so we did that uh, window there it also made us sit down and think long and hard uh, about in the next government uh, and in the next master plan how we need to look at Jordan, the, the Lebanon and even Turkey. I, I don't know whether this would w cover Turkey as well, but those are Jordan and Lebanon as well as Syria could become priority countries for international development cooperation for Spain. We, we were rec recommended um, to um, come out uh, of uh, African countries and mid-income countries, uh, but we need to be sure that we have the right instruments in, in place to have those uh, funding possibilities uh, for the host countries, education and health are two priority areas. So Spain's international cooperation, um, of course, uh, can't do that if we don't have it as a priority country. One last point, really it's the third point for you to think about is uh, how humanitarian aid, the, the whole world of that has changed since this crisis. If you go back to the 2002-2003 first Iraq crisis, things have changed uh, in the Middle East. Now the, the MO, the modus operandi of a lot of humanitarian agencies has changed uh, because it's not always the right way to proceed in a context like this. And we've seen those in that documentary, the food vouchers that Honey was talking about, to go out and buy his food from shops. That was the way things work. And then multi-purpose cash assistance is another new uh, option that exists now for people to buy the, up their different basic needs, and that's under UNHCR. So we have to really harmonize all of these different humanitarian aid options, particularly in a context where a lot of these refugees, the Syrian refugees, are urban refugees. Uh, they are being hosted by uh, local uh, families uh, who are their relatives or simply they're just living in the cities. It's very difficult to, to tra keep track of them because they're moving around all the time. They're not just in one single place, and that makes it very hard when you're devising and designing humanitarian relief uh, programs. We need a lot more uh, monetary systems and we're seeing more of that. That, fortunately, is one step forward. And I think that is a success story here in, in our world. People can just start to choose, actually, what they need, whether it's education, whether it's pay, help with paying the rent. And it's not just a question of giving things in, in objects, uh, items in kind. This is the way things used to be. I think this crisis, therefore, uh, really is a watershed uh, point uh, for the system and humanitarian aid and we would hope uh, certainly that uh, as soon as possible we can get that political solution as all the parliament said it's the only way out thank you